Yeah, but well, just a couple of us for now. But we will definitely be getting going in a bit. Um, we've got about eight minutes till class time, so I'm just here a little early, ready for class. So just get comfortable, and um, once we get there, in a few moments, we'll, we'll get underway. But thanks for being here. I hope you guys are having a good day so far. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. All right, yeah, I just sent a little follow-up uh, reminder to the whole class to just make sure to show up and to come use the link. Usually uh, many of the people will arrive like just in the last minute or so, so not to worry, but just making sure everyone gets the information they need. If you're here and you want to say hi or anything, go ahead and try and use our live chat here to the uh, right, you'll see, um, where you can type in text. When you do that, I'll see your comments and stuff that I can re reply during the lecture in real time. <clears throat> hey, no rush, just about four more minutes and then we will uh, get our meeting underway. Sorry, just a second, we're back. Oh. Okay, just another three or so minutes.
hope you guys' first week of class has been pretty good so far. Easing back into the routine with the new year. Hopefully got a little new energy to uh, press forward to the summer. <clears throat> Welcome everyone that's showing up. Good to see you guys. Another couple minutes. Welcome to class. Just waiting for 2.30. Hey Angelica, good to see you there. Anybody else feel free if you'd like to say hi. <clears throat> good afternoon. Hey there. Hi Maria. Jack. Eddie. Hey Diego, how's it going? Catherine, good to see you too. Good to see the, the crew showing up. Appreciate you guys. Okay, just another minute. I'm just hanging in here and then we'll get going. <clears throat> hey David, how's it going? Oh yeah, not to worry. <laughs> hey Spencer, good to see you. Hey there, Isaac. Okay, just a couple moments, and we're pretty much good to go. It's going pretty good. Hey, AJ. Thanks for being here. All right, guys, it's 2.30, so I'm going to go ahead and let us get um, underway. Thanks, everybody, for uh, showing up to the meeting, following the links, and uh, staying in touch with our class announcements. So that we're all clear, this is our format, right? We're going to be meeting on YouTube Live um, twice a week, Monday, Wednesday, 2.30 to 3.45. So, I mean, I think it's a pretty simple and straightforward interface. You subscribe to this channel, please, so that you get notifications, and then you'll be in... Uh, in good touch with the class whenever it's live and um, yeah just tune in during our regular class times like you're doing now and uh, take your good notes ask whatever questions that you like and comment and contribute as you wish in the um, live chat and you know I'm gonna see your comments and I'll reply to them in real time and we'll have good discussions and uh, and informative detailed lessons let me say this and hello to everyone just arriving um, just for the purposes of getting like some general sense of attendance, I'll, I'll ask the members that are present to just um, type into the chat one time uh, so that I have that on the record because the live chat is saved with the archived lecture as well. So when I go back and look at it later, I can use that as a basic way of um, verifying attendance if I ever want to. Like I tell you, I'm not a stickler about it, but I do kind of like to have um, some kind of record. So right now, if you're present and you're hearing me, uh, go ahead and write something that indicates that you're here. Hello or whatever. And one other thing, I noticed that sometimes people are going to have um, handles on YouTube that don't match their name in the course. So if that's the case, also include in your comment that you're typing in what name you have that's in our roster so that I can easily um, associate your being present with this uh, name that's in the roster, okay? So does that make sense? Everybody here, just one time, quickly check in. Hi, thanks, River. Thanks, everybody else. Um, and that's one way that I'll just kind of quickly get 
the whole roll call out of the way. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to do it. Thank you guys. Okay, no problem. And you know, Derek, it doesn't really matter to me whatever uh, account you prefer is okay, but it does, I guess, make it a little easier to see your name there. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. So um, today's our first, you know, lecture on topics in the textbook. Um, yes, it is kind of a thick book. I saw your comment up there, um, but that's good, right? I mean, thick book, more information, more information, more stuff to read. That's nice. Uh, but we are going to start at the beginning of the book, and um, the first main topic in this class is philosophy of religion. So um, did, did we have this discussion about what the word philosophy means if you break down the root meaning of it? I'm not sure if we had that conversation or if I didn't get to mention it yet. Someone let me know in the chat or if you already know from prior knowledge, what the word philosophy means. If you don't know and we didn't talk about it, then let me know that so I can be clear that I should mention it. What does this word philosophy mean? What could it possibly mean? I mean, I know it's our class subject name, but when you go back into the old school history, any knowledge? No? Okay. Well, no problem. Let me tell you. I'll inform you. Um, so the word philosophy actually derives from Greek, and um, if you break it down, it has two roots. So one part of it is from the Greek word philia, which means to love. So like you've heard perhaps words like um, um, a bibliophile, a lover of books, audiophile, lover of sound. Um, you know, you've heard words of that kind. Cinephile, lover of cinema. Well, philia is a Greek word which just means to love. Now, sophi, the second part of the word philosophy, comes from the Greek word sophia. Now, you may hear the word sophia nowadays. You just think of it as a, as a nice name, and it is. But it originally derives from the Greek word sophia, which means, in Greek, um, wisdom. So when you see the two uh, etymological origins of the word philosophy, now hopefully we can bring that into clearer focus. What is philosophy? It is the love of wisdom. And what is a philosopher? A lover of wisdom. So um, if you trace back the history of the academy, of the university, and all the academic disciplines that we study, biology, science, you know, chemistry, history, literature, um, all of them originally derived from the field of philosophy, which in its earliest meaning, tracing back thousands of years to ancient Greece, was just a pursuit of wisdom in whatever area of human experience that we could pursue it in. So nowadays, of course, philosophy has a more narrow meaning. It's an academic discipline in the humanities, which studies the works of great philosophical writers throughout the generations as they consider all kinds of heady and deep topics, right? But um, Originally, it's merely to love wisdom. And so anybody who has that kind of curiosity about how does the world work, what is my place in it, what is the ultimate truths that I can possibly understand um, of all things, large and small and in between. If you're that kind of person who has that frame of mind, who you want to lear learn and you wonder about the possibilities of knowledge that you don't yet have, then you kind of have the spirit of the philosopher. It's interesting because many other academic disciplines have the word logos, as part of their root, like biology comes from logos, and logos is from the old Greek meaning the uh, the logic or the concept of something. So, like the logic of life, that's biology. But it's only philosophy that has sophia as part of its root, which is um, uh, sorry, aphelia as part of its root, which is which is to love. So, love and a passionate pursuit of knowledge and wisdom lies right at the heart of. Of philosophy so it's an academic subject that we study but it's also something that carries with it a sense of like purpose and meaning we're searching for um, wisdom which we love to pursue um, so anyway just a setting stage touchstone here philosophy is our course topic and it's all about the pursuit of wisdom and the love of the pursuit of wisdom now wisdom is a broad concept and it could be developed in any number of different areas so there's a lot of subcategories of philosophy just like in the sciences, people don't just say, hey, 
I'm studying science. They say, well, I'm studying uh, biology or chemistry or physics or geology, right? It's like a specific sub-discipline or branch of science. Well, in philosophy, there are also a whole bunch of subcategories. And one of them is philosophy of religion. So we're starting with that as our first unit of the course. But we're going to move on from that later in the semester to other big topics and subjects in philosophy. There's ethics, there's metaphysics, there's philosophy of mind. So there's many different categories of uh, philosophy. And we start with this one. Okay. So philosophy of religion is the pursuit of wisdom and the love of wisdom in all things and all matters religious. Um, so in the philosophy of religion, we do attempt to clarify religious claims and positions and to evaluate um, the arguments for and against the existence of God. Um, everyday people and philosophers, of course, can fit into one of three possible categories when it comes to the question of God and religion. So here we go. Three positions on, um, on the existence of God. Now, some people are in the category of what we call theists. Um, in other words, theism. So theism is the idea, and a theist is a person who subscribes to that. Just like Buddhism is an ideology or an idea, and a Buddhist is a person who practices it. Um, so, theism. What do you think is the position of theism? Um, or maybe I'll, maybe I'll label it in terms of the individual adherence, because that'll make the definition easy. So, what is a theist? It's a person who thinks what? Have you ever heard that word? Is that in your vocabulary? Let's draw that out and put it on the table. Who are the theists in this world? They are people who think what? Yes, that they believe in God. And so to be precise, these are people who believe that God exists, that God's real. That's not just make-believe or something like a storybook or just made up or fake. People who are theists say and believe God exists. So people who believe that God exists. Okay, now, but that's not the only point of view. That's one view, uh, but there are others. Even if this is the predominant position of most people on the planet, it's not the only one. On the other side, there are those that are atheists, or they subscribe to atheism. What is an atheist? It's different than a theist, but what is it? Who knows this? The atheist is a person that what? I'm sure someone knows this one. So let's see. I'll often do that. I'll often be like, what do you guys know? I'll survey your knowledge and come back to the notes. So yeah, those that don't believe in God, a person that does not believe that God exists. Alicia, you say those that believe in science? Oftentimes, yes. But sometimes there are people who hold scientific views and they also believe in God. And sometimes there are people who really reject science, but they still don't necessarily have religious belief. But yes, that's a fair point. Anyway, yeah, those that don't believe that God exists. So... People who do not believe that God exists. Okay, and there's um, there's one more viewpoint. I guess I'm going to clear this part of the board to create some space. Um, but yeah, before I move on to the third. So atheist, this is just the contrary of theism. It's a person that thinks there's no God. Sometimes a person may be an atheist because they just believe that there's not enough uh, empirical evidence for it, or maybe they studied philosophical arguments for and against God's existence, and they found the criticisms of the theist arguments better. But, you know, um, there's a significant number of people. In fact, I've heard that the percentages of atheism, in the, especially in the Western world, are kind of on the overall increase. But as a general matter, it is still a minority position for sure. I think in the United States, um, it's something like 70 plus percent Christian. And then you have the field of other religions and there's like a 10 percent or so uh, range of the population that's atheist. And globally, atheism is a minority position. But, you know, it's a position that many people hold. So anyway, these are opposite points of view on the question, is there a God? 
But there's also sometimes agnostic, which people talk about as a third point of view. Agnosticism would be the idea behind who is an agnostic. What is that? Anybody have a view or even just a guess? What could it be to be an agnostic? It's something a little different than these other two, but it's on the same topic. What could that, what could that be? Just see if you have any idea. It's a little bit of a little, little more in the middle kind of. But what do you think? How would you put that? <clears throat> they don't practice religion. Okay, I see you saying that, Kristen. Uh, sorry, Kirsten. Uh, and Spencer, you're saying doesn't know one way or the other. I think it's a little closer to that comment. Um, someone that's not sure. Okay, good. Yes. Believe there's not sufficient evidence. Very precise. Yeah. So let me bring all those things together and just state it here concisely. It's a person who just won't take a position for or against. This is someone who said, like, kind of shrugging their shoulders and saying, I don't know. Um, so they, they suspend judgment. They do not affirm nor deny. And why is that what they think? Well, the agnostic says, I'm going to hold a neutral position because I don't think there's good enough evidence to prove it either way. So that's the view of the agnostic. Um, <clears throat> those who uh, suspend judgment, meaning that they do not judge it either way, and why do they do that? Uh, because of a perceived lack of evidence. So, I mean, whether there is good enough evidence or not, these folks think that there's not significant enough evidence to, to prove or disprove whether God exists. So, um, let me see some comments that I'm looking at here. Sounds like acknowledging so many beliefs on both sides. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of like an in-between, you know. Um, they're thinking that the question of God's existence can't be determined based on the evidence that I'm looking at now. So those are folks who say I'm not going to uh, claim there is God, nor am I going to claim there's no such thing. I'm in a state of suspended judgment because of the lack of better evidence. Um, now, to be fair... Sometimes I've heard people say that they think agnosticism is not a true third category. Some people think that it's really just another variation of atheism because it's not something on a par with saying you believe in God. And some people argue that everything other than affirmatively believing God is some version of atheism. But I kind of prefer to break it down in terms of these three because I think it just makes sense. Belief, don't believe, and just not sure. That's kind of the general way that many... Uh, people talk about these concepts. So, right, we're going to study arguments from all sides of this debate. We're going to look at the best high-quality arguments that have ever been written in history from theists trying to make the case for God's existence. And we're also going to look at criticisms that others make to try and show that, there's, that those arguments don't work. And, you know, the point of this is just for you to understand the various arguments that are being exchanged back and forth so that you can report on them, that you can discuss them, and maybe state your judgment about the quality of the various arguments. So in a philosophy class, you have to become a master of comprehending and presenting the arguments of the philosophers. So we're starting with philosophy of religion, and we're going to take stock of what are some of the big heavyweight arguments for God's existence that we can trace throughout the centuries going back. All right, so that's our goal. We start now with some of the major arguments in favor of God's existence. Um, so to begin, one of the main arguments for God's existence that goes back at least a thousand years is the one that we're going to start to discuss here. So there's many different ways to try and make the case that God exists. Um, and when we make the case for something in philosophy and in logic, we say making an argument. The word argument doesn't necessarily mean the same thing that it does in everyday life. When you think of an argument, sometimes you think of like your parents fighting or people yelling at each other or even getting physical or making fun of each other. But in logic and philosophy, argument has a much more pristine kind of just formal meaning. It just means to try and present reasons in favor of some conclusion. So arguments don't imply anything about people being mean to each other, not liking each other. It just means trying to make a persuasive case for what you believe is true. So we're going to study arguments, and we're going to study some arguments that theists have given, and also criticisms. I see here Jazz. I wonder if the same people who don't believe in God also don't believe in angels. Well, I mean, yeah, I would think so. If you didn't believe in God, you probably don't believe in the supernatural. Uh, but 
I guess it's it's not logically impossible to think that there could be a supernatural realm without a creator God. It's possible, but it would be, I think, uncommon. Okay, so arguments for God's existence. We're starting with this. This is called the ontological argument. Okay, so the first big argument for God's existence that we're all reviewing is called the ontological argument. Where does this argument come from? Okay, well, one of the first places that we see it appear in the Western world is in the writings of this famous saint and philosopher named Saint Anselm. Saint Anselm lived from the year 1033 until 1109. So that's like, you know, um, right about a thousand years ago. This is 2021. We're talking about 1033 and then, you know, on 76 years into his life before he passed away. So who was St. Anselm? Well, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury, so he held an important um, position in society. But he also was a church scholar. And after his life, he was canonized in the Christian church as a saint, which... This is before the, the Protestant Reformation and the split, the schism of the church into Catholicism and Protestantism. So back then it was just the Christian church. But nowadays, of course, the lineage of saints is associated primarily with the Catholic denomination of Christianity. So anyway, this is a church scholar, a learned figure, and a canonized saint in the Christian church. He wrote a book, and uh, this book came out in 1077. The book is called The Proslogion. So Mr. St. Anselm, who lived during this century in the medieval period, wrote a book in 1077 called The Proslogion. And in The Proslogion, he tries to make the case by rational argument that God exists. So he tries to present what he considers to be a very strong argument for the existence of God. And he thinks that anybody who just considers his reasoning will come to the same conclusion and he thinks that this is really proof there has to be God based on this argument okay now um, he calls the argument the ontological argument don't worry too much about what this word ontological means but from Greek ontos it has to do with being and existence so it's an argument that tries to prove God exists based on the nature of what kind of being he is believed to be so, um, <clears throat> one more thing I want to say about this argument before I really get into the big details of it. It's an argument that has nothing to do with empirical evidence. It is not based on empirical evidence, okay? Who thinks they know what the word empirical evidence means? Anybody have a vague or precise idea of that? What could be empirical evidence if you, if you think you know? Because this argument is not based on empirical evidence. So, let's clarify what that means. What is empirical evidence? Anybody got something for me on that? If not, I'll tell you. I just want to see if anyone had an existing understanding. You say undeniable evidence. Uh, not exactly, because you could still challenge the presentation of empirical evidence, but it's usually considered good evidence. David, you say facts um, of a kind, yes, but what sort of facts? I like what you say, Carson. That's quite clear, close to the precise definition. Um, and also Isaac, that's, that's also um, along the right lines. So empirical evidence is just evidence that can be observed by the five senses. So it sometimes is called physical evidence. It's evidence that you can see, taste, touch, hear, or smell. So we have five physical senses, right, that we use to like perceive our surroundings. Empirical evidence is evidence that is based on what you can judge with the five senses. So for example, let me give you a, qu a quick example. I'm talking here about this word, empirical evidence. And so that's um, based on the five senses. And so we could say, to sort of put a parenthesis at the end, physical evidence. So, for example, guys, like, just want to like make sure we all understand the concept and give an example. 
Is there evidence that the dinosaurs existed? Yes. What's that evidence? What gives us any reason to believe or think that there were dinosaurs? What's the evidence? There's definitely evidence, but what is it? It's the fossils, correct. It's the fossils that we've literally dug up from the ground and excavated and assembled back into the original skeleton of the, of the life form. So is that empirical evidence? Yes, because fossils are things that you see and that you physically remove and that you carbon date, okay? So that would be empirical evidence. But Anselm's argument for God's existence here, it's not based on empirical evidence. So it's not like he says, here's the proof that God exists. I found this piece of fabric in a tomb. And if you look at it under a microscope, you're going to see his DNA. It's not like that at all. Okay, so it's not based on anything that you could see, taste, touch, hear, or smell. Instead, it's based on just logic and reason alone. Okay, now that does not mean that it's a bad argument, but it's not drawing on any kind of physical source of evidence. It's based instead just on reason, logic, and it's conceptual, okay? Um, I see the suggestion of avocados. I don't know. Is there evidence of dinosaurs that comes from the nature of the avocado? If so, it's a fact I'm not aware of. Say hi to Peachy again. You guys know her, right? She came up during the other meeting, right? You guys know my cat? Good girl. Yeah, so she's a good kitty. But Peachy, I'm doing my job right now. I gotta do my lecture. So, set her down. She might come back though. Okay, yeah, so ontological argument, guys. Now we're ready to dive in. I just had to set the stage. This is an argument given a thousand years ago by this Christian saint in his book, The Proslogian, and it's not based on empirical evidence at all. So now let's go. <clears throat> Peachy, maybe I can make you lay down. There you go, girl. No? Okay, so <clears throat> first thing he does here is he asks the reader a question that um, we all have to think about. What is God believed to be? You know, what kind of being is God believed to be? So we're really asking here, what are the general characteristics or attributes that you would think of when you think of the concept of God? So... <clears throat> um, Okay, so I want you to think about your idea of God, right? Um, what kind of qualities, attributes, is God assumed to have by the definition of God? Like, what kind of being is God thought of as by just all people, pretty much? God is known or thought of as being like what? Tell me what you think God is supposed to be like by means of attributes or characteristics. Okay, good. Almighty. Almighty. So there's like kind of a, a technical word that's used in philosophy sometimes to designate almighty. Has anyone ever heard this word? It's, it's a fancy sounding word. It's uh, omnipotent. Very good, Isaac. Yeah. So one of them is omnipotent. And what that means is uh, all powerful. So potent means power. Omni means all. So omnipotent being is an all-powerful being, and that is one of the things that is believed of God, that God has power, but not just a finite amount, but unlimited, infinite power. He could do anything, make anything happen merely by his will. Okay, so one of the attributes of God that we, you know, characteristically learn of is that he's thought to be awesomely powerful, and there's nothing he could never, there's nothing that he could not do, right? He's unlimited in power and potential. So that's omnipotence. But that's not the only one. What else? So there's all power and kind of in the same lines, all but something else. Not just all powerful, but also I see a couple of other things here. So I see something great and forgiving and good. Um, yeah, we can put goodness there too. And the word that's used is omnibenevolence when it's about God. Hmm. And that's just like infinitely good or all good. All right, so God is thought of as having like a, a moral basis that he's not just an all-powerful being that wants to hurt everyone and do evil, but rather that God is perfectly powerful, but also like supremely good and righteous, you know? So 
God's thought not to be morally neutral or, of course, negative, but something worthy of praise, and therefore, you know, he occupies the highest seat of morality, too. So all-powerful, all-good, um, all-knowing, yes, Catherine, and Isaac, as you add to that, the word is omniscient. So omniscient means to know everything. All-knowing. Okay, like so, benevolent means good, all benevolent. Uh, from Latin, scientia means knowledge. That's where our word science originally derives from. So omniscient is to have all knowledge, to know everything. So yeah, God is thought of as having knowledge, but not just some knowledge and other things he's unaware of, but that everything's known to God, that nothing is hidden from him, and that he knows everything from the largest to the smallest details. And then I also see now Christian... Uh, Sorry, Kirsten, is that it? Um, that you that you suggested eternal. Correct. To be eternal, the word that sometimes is used here in these discussions is omnipresent. Okay. So um, that's all present. So meaning that God is. Uh, Miguel, sorry to interrupt, but did someone make any sort of group chat? Oh, yeah, you guys can deal with uh, organizing amongst yourselves on the possibility of the group chat, but not to worry. What I mentioned here is omnipresent, all present. So God, the idea of God anyway, is that he's not just here today, gone tomorrow, um, and not just that he's in some places and absent from others, but that God is in a certain sense everywhere at all times. So God exists eternally and is manifest throughout the whole universe. So there's nowhere that he's not present and there's no time at which he doesn't exist. And that's, of course, different from me and you because, you know, we exist for whatever, like 80 years maybe, and uh, um, we're not existing eternally, nor are we everywhere all at once. Right now I'm, you know, in Long Beach and I'm not in um, Ohio. But God, according to the definition or understanding that most people have of him, is everywhere all the time. So perfectly powerful, good, knowing, and eternally present. When you summarize all these qualities together, he basically thinks that you get to this idea that God is generally thought of as the greatest conceivable being. So he doesn't go into the like exhaustive description of all these qualities. That's something that I'm kind of adding. But he knows that when anybody thinks of God, they think of a great and all-powerful, majestic being. So in other words, the summarization of this is greatest conceivable being, okay? So that's what he comes to as his conclusion. God is thought to be the greatest conceivable being. Okay, now, um, <clears throat> conceivable just means like what you could ever think of or imagine even in your mind. And so what he concludes is that the idea of God is the idea of the greatest being that you could ever even think of. And you could never think of anything that's greater than God because God, the idea of him is that he's the greatest. So <clears throat> who has this idea of God in their mind? That's his next question. He says, well, um, we already know immortality. Yes, Ismail, it would because omnipresence includes being present throughout all of time. And so that means you're immortal. Yeah. Um, but as I was asking, <clears throat> who do you think he says has this idea of God in their mind? We've talked about atheists, theists, and agnostics. Um, so who thinks the definition of God is greatest conceivable being? What do you think is Anselm's answer to that question? Like, who has that idea in the mind when they think of God? The definition of God as the greatest conceivable being. Who understands the term God that way? Which types of people? To whom? Well, okay, good, Tina. You say theists, right. To a theist, of course, God is thought of as the greatest conceivable being. It would be like sacrilegious to say something else, to say, oh, God's thought of as something subpar, not the best thing you could imagine. But hold on, okay. Little plot twist, I guess. He says this also. He says it's not just theists, though. Theists, of course, see God as defined as the greatest conceivable being. But even if you don't believe in God, 
In other words, even if you're an atheist, he says, you still understand that that's the definition of the word God. Like you still understand that when someone says God, that's what they mean. They mean the greatest conceivable being. So does that make sense to you guys? What he's trying to explain here is that actually everybody has this idea of God in their mind. So what's the real difference between theists and atheists? It's not that, well, one of them says God's the greatest conceivable being and the other doesn't even agree with that definition. They both agree with the definition at least. The difference between the theist and the atheist is simply that the theist thinks what about this being versus the atheist? Tell me that if you follow my logic here. Yeah, so the theist believes the being exists and the atheist believes the being doesn't exist. But one thing they can agree on at least is how to define the word. And so he says, let's hold on to that common ground. Everyone agrees at least on this point. The word God, if you look it up and if you just think of what it means, is something like that. It's the greatest conceivable being. So he says, I've already got leverage now because now I've gotten you to concede, if you don't say you believe in God, that you at least understand what the word means. And that's how he's going to hook you into the next series of steps in the argument. So let me read a little from his words, and you can see how this man put it himself. I try my best to bring it down to earth a little, you know, but here's how he said this back in 1077, like a thousand years ago. Okay, so this is written from his book, Proslogion, and it's in our textbook on page 15 here. And uh, the part that I'm quoting, he starts by just talking to God directly. So he says this. So this is Anselm talking. He says, well then, Lord, you who give understanding to faith, grant me that I may understand as much as you see fit, that you exist as we believe you to exist, and that you are what we believe you to be. Now, we believe that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. Or can it be that a thing of such a nature does not exist? Since, and now he quotes from the scripture, the Psalms, there's a passage that says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. So he says, um, we believe you're something than which nothing greater can be thought. Or can it be that a thing of such a nature does not exist since, quote, the fool has said in his heart there is no God, unquote. But now he continues. He says, but surely when this same fool hears what I'm speaking about, let me be clear. When he says fool, he's now using that as like a generic term or label for those who are atheists. It's not a nice thing to say, but he's quoting scripture. And he says of the fool that that's the atheist. So he says, when the fool hears what I am speaking about, namely something than which nothing greater can be thought, he understands what he hears. And what he understands is in his mind, even if he does not understand that it actually exists. Because it is one thing for an object to exist in the mind, and another thing to understand that an object actually exists in reality. Um, so... <clears throat> He's saying to you that God has a definition, and it's a definition that's understood by all people. Whether you're a believer or a non-believer, nobody says they don't have the concept of God as the greatest conceivable being. Um, so he says it's an idea that's in the mind of everyone, the idea at least of God. And the question then that remains is, is it just an idea, or is there something real in reality that matches to that idea? Um, so... Some things only exist in the mind, and some things exist in both the mind and in reality. Okay, so I'm going to clear the board here, because I think we've discussed that pretty well. And now we're going to move to the next point of explanation, which is the difference between things that exist only in the mind and things that exist in both the mind and in reality. Okay, so I'm going to kind of draw like a little diagram here. And to the left top section of this cross... I'm labeling um, exists only in the mind. And up here on the top right, I'm labeling this column exists in both the mind and in reality. Only in the mind versus both in the mind and in reality. So help me out, guys, if you can. Giving me some examples of things that I can list on this left side under the category of things that exist only in the mind. So what I'm asking you for is like something or things that are just not real. They're like make-believe things. They're things that are just 
imaginary. They're like things of fiction or things of make-believe, but they're not actually real. Okay, well, Jazz, uh, you, gave, you give an example that I understand where you're going with it because you're like, well, when I'm dreaming, the dream isn't real. But you can dream of real things. Like you can have a dream of the Eiffel Tower, and there really is an Eiffel Tower. So without more specificity, I can't say that everything that one dreams is also something that doesn't actually exist. You know what I mean? Like you can have a dream of totally fake made up stuff. And of course the dream itself is not a real event in like outside reality. But I'm asking you more for like specific objects and things that don't really exist. So good, you say unicorns, a horrible art. Your humor, it's amazing, but we all know that Wyoming exists. So back to Carson, unicorns, that's a good example. Okay, so now you got the kind of feeling, right? Expand on that kind of genre of examples. A unicorn exists only in the mind, but there's no real flesh and blood unicorns that roam around and are actual things that exist in reality. So what else is like that? Let's hear the next thing. Yeah, yeah, continue. What's another example? Because it's not just unicorns, right? I mean, you guys watch movies and stuff, don't you? Read books. <clears throat> leprechauns, okay, good. Oh, leprechauns on the mind, Santa, okay. Good, Ishmael, we'll get to that, though, in a minute. But, yeah, so, uh, leprechaun. You know, the little mythical, I suppose, Irish guys that are at the end of the rainbow. The Sasquatch, Bigfoot, yeah, dragons, Godzilla, lots of stuff. <clears throat> um, you mentioned Santa Claus, and I understand like the mythical Santa Claus, but there actually was someone named Saint Nicholas, who some people argue is like the historical um, link to the legend. Um, the Sandman, yeah, that's a fine example. Doesn't he come when you're sleeping and help you get into your dreams or whatever? So anyway, all these things exist only in the mind. We can continue and add more, you know, um, take your favorite like Marvel character or whatever. But you understand that that's a whole option of like stuff. Over here though, this I believe will be very easy for you to come up with because uh, just look around you. Anything that you can see right now is something that you could also think about, but it's not just in your head, it's real. So tell me some random stuff that's real, and it's also stuff that you can mentally think about. So it's not just like a make-believe idea. Rain, dogs, okay, your phone, that's all fine, yeah. How about like instead of a category, like a specific thing? Because I know cars, you know, snow, etc. How about a specific public object that we all know exists? Just to kind of throw some different examples out there. Who's got one? An iPhone 6? Yeah, but that's still a category. Um, my cat? Okay, I think, yeah, you said my cat, Peach. Uh -huh. um, I was thinking, like, you know, Statue of Liberty, good. Mona Lisa, Eiffel Tower, good. That's all good. So if you're thinking right now the Statue of Liberty, and I guess you are because I'm saying it, just know that it's not just located only in your mind, but it's out there in the universe. Okay, water, good example, too. And on and on and on. Okay, so point taken that some things exist only in the mind and they're just not real. But then there are things that exist both in the mind, but they're also real on top of that. Now, here's what Anselm says. It's basically this question. He says, everybody understands the definition and the idea of God, which means this, that everybody can say that God exists at least in what way? It, at a minimum... He believes that we have to concede or agree that God exists in what? Like something that even atheists don't deny. That God is a thing that we can think of and therefore is something that at a minimum exists what? Let's see if you can make this little leap of logic. So he says everyone has the same definition of God. You don't need to be a theist to understand what the word God means. So right, that means that even atheists understand the idea of God. So the idea of God is in everyone's mind at a minimum. And the only question left over then is, is he also in reality too though? Or is God just something in the mind? So is God something like a, like a unicorn or a leprechaun or a dragon, like a fake made up figment of our imagination that's not really real? 
Or is it like this stuff, something that is real? And of course, we can also think about it, but that does not mean that it's not real. It's also real. So which kind is God? So here's where he gets to the conclusion that God has to be on this side of the ledger. Because he says, what's that definition of God that we already um, established and said is universal? The universal common idea of God is the idea of the what kind of being? Tell me again. Let's just get back into that one time. The idea of God is that he's what type of being again? He's, in summary, you know, the bottom line, he's the overall what kind of being? Omnipresent, yeah, greatest conceivable being, correct. So he says God's the greatest conceivable being. That's the definition of this being. But, okay, tell me, what's greater, do you think, between these two options? Is it greater to only exist in the mind, or is it greater to exist in the mind, but on top of that, reality too? Like, what would be the greater thing for something? To be only in your head or real also? So you got these two choices. Which do you think is the greater of the two possibilities? To be only in the mind or in both the mind and in reality? That's my new question for you. Both. Yes. Both. Because it's just more reality. I mean, it's like existing in the mind is one thing. But if you also exist in reality, that's extra. That's more. So that's existing in two ways rather than just one. So if God is truly the greatest conceivable being, and that's his definition, then what Anselm is claiming is that he has to exist in both the mind and in reality. Because if he did it, and if it was like one of these things, then God would not be the greatest conceivable being. But that would be a logical contradiction because we've already asserted that that is his definition. So it's kind of like this tricky logic puzzle. He says, point number one, everyone agrees God's definition is greatest conceivable being. And some things exist only in the mind, like this stuff. And then some stuff exists in both the mind and reality, like these things. So question, which one is God? Only in the mind, like the atheist thinks, or in both the mind and in reality, like the theist believes? And he says, well, if you're saying that he's the greatest conceivable being, and that's the definition, then you're locked in to uh, concluding that he has to be both real and in the mind. Because if he was not, then he would fail to satisfy the requirement of the definition, which is that he's the greatest conceivable being. A being that only exists in your head is not the greatest thing that you can possibly imagine. And therefore, if God only existed in your mind, then it wouldn't be God. So therefore, God has to exist in both. Otherwise, we contradict the definition. Now I'll read on from the book a little bit. Is it still a flawed argument? Yes, I would think so. Yes, Ismail. But we're going to study criticisms as well. So don't worry. If you're thinking as you hear me say this, and if you read the book, this can't be the only uh, final word. There have to be reasons to dispute this. Not to worry, you're definitely going to hear a whole solid set of criticisms. There's major criticisms to this argument, but it has some persuasive power, and that's why we're learning it. So let me read a little bit about what he says after that. He says, it's one thing for an object to exist in the mind, and another thing to understand that an object actually exists. So when a painter plans beforehand what he's going to paint, he has the picture in his mind. So he's talking about, like, say you're a painter, and you're, like, dreaming of a painting that you want to create. But right now it's just, like, in your head the idea of what it will look like so for now before you've done the painting it's only in your mind but then he says suppose you go out and actually now paint it on the canvas he says um so he has the painting in his mind but he doesn't yet think that it actually exists because he has not yet executed it however when he has actually painted it then he both has it in his mind and he understands that it exists in reality because now he has made it so even the fool he says is forced to agree that something than which nothing greater can be thought exists in the mind, since he understands this when he hears it, like he understands the word God when it is spoken, and whatever is understood is in the mind. And surely that than which a greater cannot be thought cannot exist in the mind alone, because if it exists only in the mind, it could be thought to exist in reality also, which is greater. If then that than which a greater cannot be thought exists in the mind alone, this same that than which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought. But this is obviously impossible. Therefore, there is absolutely no doubt that something than which a greater cannot be thought exists both in the mind and in reality. Okay, so that is the basic uh, concise statement of his argument. It 
it takes the definition of God and it uses that to reach the conclusion that he's real. He says, if you agree that the definition of God is greatest conceivable being, and you must agree because that's the common understanding of it, then at a minimum you have to consider that he exists in your mind because you're thinking of the idea. So the next question is, is he only in your mind? Like some of this fake stuff that's not real. But he says, no, that's not possible because if so, then he would not be what? The greatest conceivable being because it's greater to exist in both than in just the one. So given that this is greater and given that God's definition is greatest conceivable being, we would contradict the definition to say that he's only in the mind because that's lesser than uh, perfectly great. Let me make one more point about the way he talks and writes here because it's sometimes a tongue twister type of like confusing verbiage. Um, I presented the definition of God to you in this straightforward way, greatest conceivable being. And that's what he's talking about. But sometimes he chooses to use this odd sounding phrase. He will sometimes say the being than which none greater can be conceived. So just understand that when you're like looking at his words and you see this phrase, what that means is greatest conceivable being. He just sometimes chooses to state it in the comparative, like God is the being than which by comparison, no other being that's greater can be conceived. So like you can't think of something greater than God. He's the, he's the top. He's the, you know, the, the height of like all possible concepts of greatness. So he's the being than which no other greater being can be conceived. But I find that this with a double negative, the being than which none greater can be, is sometimes a confusing way of wording it. So I oftentimes just say it more uh, simply, which is he's thought of as the greatest conceivable being. So like in these passages, um, he says, even the fool is forced to agree that something than which nothing greater can be thought exists in the mind that the greatest conceivable being exists in the mind, since he understands this when he hears it. And surely that than which a greater cannot be thought, anyways, and surely the greatest conceivable being, cannot exist in the mind alone. Because if it exists in the mind alone, it could be thought to exist in reality, which would be greater. So if that than which a greater cannot be thought exists in the mind alone, this same that than which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought. So hopefully this will kind of demystify some of the um, odd sounding locutions that you'll encounter as you read this. This is why it's important to attend lectures and kind of get a little bit of help um, to facilitate your better understanding of some of these old school writings. Um, okay, so who could tell me in a quick little couple sentences, don't have to hit me with all the big points that we've covered here, but what do you think is the basic rundown of this argument in a couple of basic statements? Like how does this man, Anselm, try to show you that God exists. How does he start off? He starts by saying what? Just walk me back through how we got to this point. So I made sure that you digested that. So to begin his argument, he's trying to prove God exists, right? And he says what to start this case? He says, first of all, let's establish that what? Walk me through his reasoning one more time, coming back to, to me from you, the students. <clears throat> it's okay if it's a little bit uh, tentative and, and you know hesitant at first, but we'll get it out there. So he's in everyone's mind, good. Correct, Sarah. And Summer, we all define God as, a, as an all-powerful being, yes. The all-powerful thing, if you remember, was just kind of like one of the criteria that I used to lead us to the summary. And that summary is what you really want to mention here. So overall, when you get all of those qualities listed, you see God as the greatest conceivable being. Good, Ishmael. He's universally defined as the greatest conceivable being. Whether you're theist or not, we, we don't necessarily disagree that that's the meaning of the term. Okay, and then from there he says, what next? Everyone agrees that God is defined as the greatest conceivable being. So if we define him as that, then he must exist because how would an all-powerful being not exist? Yes, Summer, but let's be a little even more precise. He must exist in both what and what. If God's definition is the greatest conceivable being, he believes this means that he must exist not only in blank, 
but both in blank and blank. So t tell me that. Isaac, God exists because if we accept that he's the greatest conceivable being, whether or not we believe, he's still, and that's not it, Isaac, no. I mean, it's not just um, that you have the idea of him, so he exists. It's about what greatness implies when you compare the ways that a thing can exist. So Diego, you're saying the mind and reality, yes. God has to exist in the mind and reality because if he didn't exist in both, then he would lack some greatness, and that would contradict the definition. So that would be like saying God is not God or God is not the greatest conceivable being. Let me see more commentary here. Even if you do not believe it, you understand the definition. For him to be the most greatest and powerful person, he must also exist in reality and mind. Very good, yes. Must exist in both mind and reality. And why, though? Remember again, it is because it's greater to exist in both the mind and the reality than to merely exist in the mind. So since God is defined as the greatest, the thing that nothing greater could ever be imagined, um, he would have to have all perfections, including existence. Lacking existence would mean that he lacks some degree of greatness, but the greatest conceivable being would be the greatest, and therefore he couldn't miss any of it. Um, one could not exist without the other. That's not necessarily true. I mean, a thing could exist only in the mind without being real. Um, so the implication is that it's greater to exist in both. And since it's greater to exist in both, a being defined as greatest could not lack in that way. Okay, Ismail, God must exist in both reality and mind if he is the greatest conceivable being. If he only existed in the mind, he would not be the greatest. Very good, very clear, yes. Okay, now, that's the real core argument of the ontological argument. But he goes a little further after that. On the next page, on page 16 in our book, he adds a further conclusion to this, okay? So he says, not only must God exist based on the definition that, that he has, greatest conceivable being, and the related point, that it's greater to be in both the mind and in reality than merely the mind alone. He continues from there to say that God also cannot even be thought not to exist. All right, now that's a little bit of a tongue twister yet again. So let me slowly walk you through what I'm saying. His next point in the argument is that God cannot be thought to not exist. So what that says is that the thought that God does not exist is impossible to have. It's not possible to even have the thought there's no God in your head. So he, th he says that is not possible to even think. Um, why does he say that? Because here's why. He says if you can think of something as not existing, if a being can be thought to not exist, then it lacks a certain amount of perfection. So like take me, for example. Uh, I exist, and you know that because I'm talking to you. But sad as it may be, I can, I can imagine myself not existing. Like in the future, I can imagine myself dying, all right? Uh, so I'm a being that can be thought to not exist. Uh, so I'm not perfect. But what's more perfect than me would be a being that could not even be thought to not exist, okay? So he's saying that God, based on his definition, has to be the greatest. And so included in that greatness is that he can't be what? Who can write that? Who can write the conclusion of what I've just said? Since God is defined as the greatest conceivable being, he cannot be what? Let's see if you can state that for me. If not, I'll return to it and put it out there for you again, but see if you follow my words. Since God is defined as the greatest conceivable being, Good Vortex or Spencer, you say he cannot be denied existence. Right, so he cannot be thought to not exist. Let me put some notes here for you. Cannot be thought to not exist. Um, now, let's be careful, though, Isaac. It's not that he, you're saying he cannot be untrue. Yeah, but that's, that's already been established in the first part of the argument, that he must exist. This is different, though. This is about whether you could even think that he does not exist. So one proof is that he must exist because it's greater to really exist than to just be in your head. But additional to that, 
is that this perfection and being greater than anything else you could imagine also carries with it this implication, that being that great bars you from even being able to be thought of as non-existent by a person. So if someone can think of a being as not existing, then that's not a perfect being. Okay, so he's so perfect that even the thought God doesn't exist cannot even be placed in your mind. Okay, now let me read his words on this. And if you can hang on through this passage and just follow the logic, um, then you'll understand how this connects to what I've just said. So he says, and certainly this being so truly exists that it cannot be even thought not to exist. For something can be thought to exist that cannot be thought not to exist. And this is greater than that which can be thought not to exist. Hence, if that than which a greater cannot be thought can be thought not to exist, then that than which a greater cannot be thought is not the same as that than which a greater cannot be thought, which is absurd. Something than which a greater cannot be thought exists so truly then that it cannot be even thought not to exist. And then he talks to God for a minute and he says, and you, Lord God, are this being. You exist so truly, Lord God, that you cannot even be thought not to exist. And this is as it should be, because if some intelligence could think of something better than you, the creature would be above the creator and would judge the creator. And that is totally absurd. In fact, everything else there is, except for you alone, God, can be thought of as not existing. You alone, then, of all things most truly exist, and therefore of all things possess existence to the highest degree. Because anything else does not exist as truly and so possesses existence to a lesser degree. Why then did the fool say in his heart there is no God? When it is so evident to any rational mind that you of all things exist to the highest degree. And then he says, kind of a little harsh, why indeed? Unless because he was stupid and a fool. So I mean, it's not a good thing to say about a person who doesn't share your beliefs on anything. But, you know, that's Anselm's words and writing. So let me go back into the comments here. I see. So the thought of not existing is an imperfection. But God is perfect, so not only should he exist, yes, horrible art, but additional to him having to exist is that he also has to be incapable of being thought to not exist. Okay? Now, Sarah, you add to that. Is that why some theists get so upset with atheists? Because they are implying that God is not perfect by denying his existence. Right. Well, um, I don't know about each individual person who becomes upset with a challenge to their theism from atheists, where it's coming from. Uh, but yes, I mean, that's a possibility. You know, people might say that if you claim God doesn't exist, you're not thinking of the right idea because God cannot even be thought of that way. In fact, that's the next thing that Anselm says, which wraps up his passage here of writing that I assigned to you. The last part is this. So if God cannot be thought to not exist, then what are we going to say about atheists? Because... Right, as we've already learned the definition, and as we all understand, an atheist is a person who says they don't believe in God. So it sounds like Anselm is saying it's not even possible for that to be the case, it's because if it were, then God would lack some perfection. So what's going on then? Do the atheists not have the thought that they say they have? Well, Anselm actually does go there, and he says, to anybody out there saying, I think there's no God, he says, no, you don't think that, because that's not even possible to think. He says what the person really is thinking is of something else, which they mislabel with the terminology of God. So he says to, pre to people who deny the existence of God, they must be thinking with a different definition. They, they are not thinking of the greatest conceivable being, because if you understand what the greatest conceivable being implies, it implies not only that he must exist in the mind and in reality, but that he cannot even be thought not to. So um, he believes that the idea of God that a so-called atheist has is not the actual idea of God. And that's the only way they can claim that God, in quotes now, does not exist. Because their idea of him is defective and it's not even true to the real concept. Here I'll read it to you what he says on that. He says, so how indeed has he said in his heart what he could not think? Right? Like how can the fool say there's no God if that's not even possible to think? Or how could he not think what he said in his heart? since to say in one's heart and to think are the same. But if he really both thought because he said in his heart and did not say in his heart because he could not think, then there is not only one sense in which something is said in one's heart or thought. Now here's the key passage. For in one sense a thing is thought when the word signifying it is thought, in another sense when the very object which the thing is is understood. 
In the first sense, then, God can be thought not to exist when you're just thinking of the word like G-O-D, but you don't understand what it means, but not in the second sense when you're thinking of the actual being. He says, no one, indeed, understanding what God is, can think that God does not exist, even though they may say those words with no meaning or with a different meaning, because God is that in which nothing greater can be thought. And whoever really understands this understands clearly that this same being so exists that not even in your thoughts can he not exist. And thus, whoever understands that God exists in this way cannot think of him as not existing. So he says, I give thanks, good Lord. I give thanks to you. Since what I believed before through your gift, I now understand through your illumination that if I did not want to believe that you existed, I would nevertheless be unable not to understand it. Okay, now let me look at some of the comment. River, I think atheists understand that God is supposed to be omnipotent. They just don't believe that it is the truth. To understand the concept of something doesn't mean you believe it's true. Right. Well, what he's saying is not technically that the atheists secretly believe in God. He's just saying that they're... Um, that their claim to not believe is is not possible because God is too great to be thought of that way. So he says when the thought is placed in the mind of the atheist, I don't think there's God, that they are using the word without its typical meaning. It's like if I said to you, hey, check out this dog, and I'm holding a marker. And every time I talk about markers, I just use the word dog. I'm using the word, but I'm not referring to it with the right understanding. Like in my mind, when I hear the word dog, I think of markers. So he's saying like to an atheist, they use the word God, but they're thinking of something substandard. They're thinking of something lesser than because that's the only way they can possibly even formulate the idea that that thing doesn't exist. Because if it was really God they were thinking of, that idea would be impossible to have because he's too great for that idea. Now, horrible art, you say. So how can you believe in something if it does not exist? And how can you not believe in something that does not exist, but have a belief in a thing that does not exist? Well, he's saying God does exist and that it's not possible to believe that he doesn't exist. His argument is God is defined by all people, even atheists, as the greatest conceivable being. If God is defined as the greatest conceivable being, then that would contradict him only existing in the mind because only existing in the mind is less great than existing in the mind and in reality. Furthermore, being thought of or being able to be thought of as not existing is less great, so he argues, than being not able to be thought of not as existing, right? So a being for whom it is impossible to think they don't exist is greater than a being for whom it is possible to think that they don't exist. Um, so as I was continuing to say, if it's greater to be in, incapable of being thought non-existence, then due to the definition of God, he must be that way. So he concludes, therefore, that there's no real way for anybody to have the idea that God doesn't exist in their mind. Um, so I'm not sure, does this answer your question? How can you believe in something if it does not exist? You can believe in lots of things that don't exist. Little kids believe in Santa. There's no problem with that. So to answer your first question, anybody can believe in a non-existent thing. Um, they just have to think that it's real, but it's not actually. Second question, how can you not believe in something that does not exist, but have a belief in a thing that does not exist? I mean, well, let me understand. How can you not believe in something that does not exist? Well, you can uh, not believe in something that does not exist. Like, I don't believe in Santa, and Santa doesn't exist. But have a belief in a thing that does not exist. Yeah, so your beliefs could be true or false. You could believe whatever you want. I mean, you could believe in the tooth fairy. You can believe the earth is flat. You can believe in things that aren't real, and you can believe in things that are real. The difference between a true and a false belief is whether the belief is correct to the facts of reality or not. So I don't think it's confusing at all. You can believe in things that are true and you can believe in things that are false. But whether they're true or false depends on the objective facts. Now, Ismail, you say, so as the greatest conceivable being, it's just wrong to deny it. He's just saying it's impossible to think that there's no God. He says it's impossible to think that there's no God. So when people say that they're thinking that, Anselm is like, no, they don't really even have that thought. They don't even know what they're thinking is what he's saying. They're, they're saying the words, there's no God, but their speech doesn't connect to the actual concept because the real idea of God cannot be thought of as non-existence or denied. Okay, so what is in the mind or thought of an atheist when they say there's no God? He says it's like a substitute concept, which is just using the same outward form of language. Like, as I just mentioned, in referring to the marker as a dog, I have a false concept of what the word dog refers to, and I'm not using the term correctly. 
So if I'm an atheist, according to Anselm, and I say there's no God, that thought is impossible if it's really about God. So he says the only way that thought can exist is if in the mind of the atheist, they have a, a different idea of the real idea of God. But let me say this to you guys that I sense a, sen a sort of criticism to the argument. That there's definitely flaws to the argument. So don't think that we're not going to try and poke holes in this and tear it down every which way. Because there's like three different objections that we're going to go into starting next time. Um, so there's certain problems with the argument. But one that I notice even right now just teaching it to you is this. Um, he starts off by saying everybody has the same definition of God, right? Like that's his opening move. He says, atheist, theist, it doesn't matter. Everyone understands that what? That God is defined, at least the definition, as the greatest conceivable being. But now at the end of the argument, it seems like he wants to switch it out. He's like, oh, but atheists, they don't really understand God when they say he doesn't exist. So which one is it then, Anselm? Do the atheists understand God's definition like everybody? Or do they fail to understand the idea of God? And that's why they have this thought in their mind that such a thing doesn't exist. Seems like sometimes he wants it a little bit of both ways. It helps his argument in the beginning to say we all have a common understanding of God and he's in all of our minds. And he's in our minds as the greatest conceivable being. But then later on he has to contend with the evident existence of atheists who he says can't possibly have the thought that God doesn't exist because God is too great for that thought to be, to be, uh, to be even formed. So what does he say of them in the end? That they must not really be thinking of the real thing. And so it doesn't count technically as a thought that God doesn't exist. Do you comprehend what I've now said? And I'll read it one more time. How could he say what he couldn't think? Um, or how could he not think what he said, since to say and think are the same? But if he really thought because he said it and did not say it because he couldn't think it, then there's not only one sense in which you say something or think it. In one sense, a thing is thought when the word is thought of, in another sense, when the object which the thing is, is understood. So he says, atheists, they're just thinking of the word God, the sound that the word has, the spelling that the word has, but they're not thinking of the deeper meaning behind it. And they would realize if they understood that God's the greatest conceivable being, that he can't possibly be thought of as non-existent, because not existing contradicts perfect greatness. Um, so this is an argument that has sometimes been called an argument by reductio ad absurdum. That's just a little piece of logical terminology. So let me just mention that quickly as we end class. So like when you um, learn about argumentation, you learn all kinds of different like logical argument strategies and lawyers and philosophers and academics of whatever kind all use these tactics. One such method of argument is reductio ad absurdum, which means to reduce to absurdity. Rivers, tell me, you say it's confusing, but you owe me a question. If it's confusing, what's confusing? Tell me what you need an explanation for. Because it's not productive to just say it's confusing. You have to learn it, so you need to not be confused. What's your question? When you give me a question, I'll answer it. Back to this. Reductio ad absurdum. It means to reduce to absurdity. It's a technique that is used in argument. This technique is when you assume that something is true, but if it were true, it would contradict something else. So the way that you deploy the method is you first want to prove something. So you assume the contrary of what you would like to prove. Okay, so reductio ad absurdum is this method of argument. You assume the contrary of what you want to prove, and you show that that would imply a contradiction or something absurd. So, for example, suppose that I want to prove to you that the earth is not flat, right? That's my argument position. I'm trying to make the case that the earth is not flat. So by means of this method, what would I assume 
in order to get to my conclusion first. For the sake of argument, you start the reductio method by assuming the opposite of your conclusion. So the conclusion I'm driving towards is the Earth is not flat. So in a reductio ad absurdum, I would begin by making what assumption? Kim, you don't want to hear God and existence in the same sentence anymore. Why not? I mean, uh, we're asking the question whether God exists or not. That's what we're definitely going to be doing for a while. And people do that all the time every day. It's, it's a major point in, like, academic history, literature, philosophy. Uh, maybe it's uh, something that is frustrating to think about, but it's good for you to be frustrated. What is the first assumption that you would make if you were trying to use reductio ad absurdum method to reach the conclusion that the Earth's not flat? You see the definition written here. Reductio ad absurdum. Assume the opposite of what you want to prove. So, in my example, I'm trying to prove that the Earth's not flat. What's the opposite of that? Uh, no, the opposite of the statement that it's not flat. My claim that I'm trying to show is that it is not flat. So the opposite of that is that what? That it is. Okay, good. So let's assume for the sake of argument that the Earth is flat. And what impossible or absurd things would that imply? If the Earth was flat, what ridiculous things do you think that that would mean as a consequence? So now I'm taking us to the next step of reductio. I'm making a case that it's not flat. Yes, I'm trying to show that it's round. But if I'm making this case and I'm using reductio, then I say, let us suppose for the sake of argument that it's flat, just for the sake of argument. Assuming that it's flat, that would imply, and then tell me something like ridiculous or absurd that that would imply, if you can think of it. If the Earth was flat, then what ridiculous or absurd thing would that mean or imply? What would be a consequence of that if that was actually true? Yeah, that you could fall off the planet, that objects that approach the edge of a big flat disk would just slip off the edge and fall off into space. But that's absurd. We know that's not true. Of course, also, Janet, we would have to assume that all the pictures and satellite images that have come to us from outer space are false um, and that they're somehow manipulated. Um, we would also have to like revise our whole understanding of why the whole planet is not bathed in sunlight at the same time. Because if it's a big flat disk, then the whole surface of it has no curvature. So why wouldn't it all be exposed to sunlight at the same time instead of having some parts that are in day and some parts that are in night? So look, on the assumption that it's flat, we have all this ridiculous, absurd stuff that we cannot make sense of. So therefore, we can safely conclude that it's not flat, okay? And that's also a fair point, Alan. Yeah, if it was flat, I guess you'd just dig through it and fall out the bottom. So on the assumption that it's flat, we get absurdity. And therefore, we can conclude what we actually started with, which is that it's not flat. Now, to point this out as it relates to Anselm, Anselm's trying to show you that God exists that he exists in both the mind and in reality, okay? So he says, assume, though, that he does not exist in both the mind and in reality. Assume that he only exists in the mind. If that was the case, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being, but that's contradictory to his definition. So if we assume the opposite of the statement that he does not only exist in the mind, so if we assume that he does only exist in the mind, we get this absurd result that he's not great, that he's not as great as you could imagine. And since that's contradictory to the concept of God, we therefore have to uh, conclude that he exists in the mind and in reality. So just telling you how he uses that like logical tactic. He also uses it again in the second part where he says, God cannot be thought not to exist. Because if he could be thought not to exist, suppose that, then he would also not be the greatest conceivable being, which would yet again contradict his definition. So he uses this reductio ad absurdum logical argument tactic to reach his conclusion. Okay, guys, so that's our first meeting. We're going to have a lot more discussion, and we'll summarize these points again. But uh, thank you so much for your attendance and your participation. You know, philosophy is a heady subject, and, yeah, it's confusing. And, you know, sometimes the way that it's written can seem a little bit esoteric, technical, mystifying, but you have to struggle with it because not everything in life is easy and not all subjects are just straightforward and concrete. Okay, so you have to try harder to make sure that you reach that higher intellectual standard. 
And thanks everybody for helping and being a big part of this. So I'll be in touch with you guys. We're always going to meet on YouTube Live unless otherwise noted. So on Monday, when we have our next meeting, come to the same lecture, come to the same YouTube channel, and, um, and we'll continue from there. All right, guys? So I'm going to let you go now. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend, and we'll be in touch. Okay, bye-bye.